This is Bloomberg Technology coming up. First on Bloomberg, our conversation with Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg on winning back the confidence of its 2 billion users in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica data scandal. Plus, tamping down the tariff rhetoric, the president's top economic advisor now saying the trade battle brewing between the world's two biggest economies can be settled diplomatically. And Twitter's war on terror. The company suspending more than a quarter of a million accounts linked to extremists. We'll check in on the race to limit hate speech on the platform. But first, to our lead, Facebook's chief operating officer talks to Bloomberg first. In the last 24 hours, the social network has said the number of users impacted by the Cambridge Analytica data scandal could be as high as 87 million, and that the public profiles of all of Facebook's 2 billion plus users could have been scraped. Facebook is changing its policies and making them more clear in response. I caught up with Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg at the Menlo Park headquarters in California and asked if it's all too little, too late. Take a listen. Well, let me address that specific issue and then talk more generally. On that specific issue, we had a feature where you could look up people by name or by email, and that was important for finding people. And someone made a directory they shouldn't have made with that information. But to be very clear and specific, all of that was public information. That was information that was already publicly available on Facebook. Now, to your broader question, we know that we did not do a good enough job protecting people's data. And I'm really sorry for that, and Mark's really sorry for that. And now what we're doing is taking really strong action. Starting Monday, we're going to be rolling out, starting the process of rolling out to people all over the world, right at the top of their newsfeed, all the apps they've connected to, and a very easy way to delete those apps. And as part of that, we're going to tell anyone who might have had their data affected or assessed by Cambridge Analytica who they are. We're taking very strong steps to restrict more data that apps historically have had access to. And we're looking beyond apps. We announced yesterday that we're taking steps to shut down certain use cases in groups and pages and search and events. These are just the latest steps. This is going to be a long process. We are systematically looking at all the ways Facebook data is used. We're going to find more things. We're going to tell you about them. We're going to shut them down. And this is a forever process, because security is always an arms race. You build, someone tries to misuse. You build, they try to misuse a new way. And we're committed to this for the very long run. Mark has personally taken responsibility. He said, we didn't take a broad enough view of what our responsibility is. That was a huge mistake. It was my mistake. How much do you feel personally responsible? I feel deeply personally responsible, because there are real mistakes that we made and that I made. And I think when you take a step back and you think about what's happened here, for a long time, we were really focused on building social experiences. And a lot of good happened because of those. And when we found problems, we would shut down that problem. So the specific case of the Friends of Fen sharing that happened with Cambridge Analytica, that specific case was shut down in 2015. But what we didn't do until recently, and what we're doing now, is just take a broader view, looking to be more restrictive in ways data could be misused. We also didn't build our operations fast enough, and that's on me. We had 10,000 people working in security at the beginning of the year. At the end of this year alone, we will more than double to 20,000. We are massively investing in smart technology, and we're doing all of this to make sure that we get to a place where we can proactively actively protect people's data. Facebook has constructed a business model that leverages personal data that users share with Facebook, and you are the chief architect of that. Assuming the business model will evolve as a result of all these changes, how will that impact the bottom line? How will that impact profitability? We've never run this company for short-term gains, and we've never run this company to maximize profits. We run this company for the long-term health of our community and business. We announced two quarters ago in earnings that these investments are big, and they will impact profitability. And that's OK with us, because it's the right thing to do. We How want much? to make these investments. We'll update at the next quarter. With all that we know now, do you believe that Facebook played a decisive role in electing Donald Trump? 
There's a lot of concern about what happened in this election. We are certainly concerned about the foreign interference on our on our platform. The overall picture here, I don't think anyone knows yet, but it's an important question, and I think it's one that's going to be studied for years and years to come. Where we're focused now is taking the lessons of past elections and making sure we apply them going forward. Foreign interference. You may have seen earlier this week, we took very strong steps to take Russian IRA content off our site. That was the content that was in the U.S. election that we did not find quickly enough, but now we're analyzing ahead. And we found 270 pages and accounts linked to them that were deceptive in Russian, targeted mostly at Russians. Our message is very clear. There is no place for this deceptive content for these troll farms anywhere in the world. We took this down in Russia. We're looking for others from other similar groups, and we're going to take them down anywhere in the world. Mark has been asked if he's the right person to lead Facebook. Do you believe that he is? He said he is. Um, do you agree? I believe deeply in Mark. Mark had a vision for what social services and social sharing could be, and that vision remains really important. Mark also, along with me and all of us, take full responsibility for what's happening here. And we're making a very important shift. We're going to keep building social products, because sharing is so important to people all over the world. And we're going to be much more proactive. Emily, I'm not going to sit here and say we won't find more problems. We will. We are going to continue to find problems. We are going to continue to shut down situations when we find them. And this is a forever thing, because security is an arms race. This is something that we're signed up for, not just now, but on an ongoing basis. Mark Zuckerberg said he hasn't seen any meaningful impact in use, but we all have friends who have taken Facebook off their phone, who are using Instagram instead, who've sworn off social media. How do you explain that? We take that really seriously. For me, personally, you know, if someone would wake up this morning or yesterday morning and say, I don't want to use Facebook, any Facebook anymore because I don't trust them, that's something I take as seriously as possible. And what I would say to them is that we're going to work hard to regain your trust. This is going to be not just a one-time thing, not one moment in time, but a long and ongoing battle. And there's a lot of good done on Facebook. We want to make sure that people feel confident and comfortable and know that they can share safely. My conversation there with Facebook COO Cheryl Sandberg. I want to bring on our Bloomberg Tech Executive Editor, Brad Stone. So, you know, the first time we're hearing Cheryl speak, in the last uh, 24 hours, a lot of revelations that she is responding to. You know, what do you make of what she had to say? Yeah, well, first of all, good interview. Uh, the, the apology tour continues. <laughs> and I think what we've seen, what we saw from her is what we've seen from Mark, which is apologize, take responsibility, outline action. So, you know, for the first time, Cheryl said she felt deeply responsible, apologized again and again, but then talked about in, in increasing the security staff to 20,000 people, you know, letting people know if their data was scraped by Cambridge Analytica. You know, the problem I have is that new rules do not necessarily detour rule breakers. In fact, we know that they don't. And this is a business and a business model that asks people to share their personal information online. You know, Cheryl acknowledges that, uh, saying that security is an arms race, but it's an arms race that's always being fought, right? There's no such thing as a deterrent here, and we're going to see this happen, as she said, probably again and again. And ultimately, she, she told me afterwards, the business model is not going to change. And, you know, if the business model is not going to, to change, you know, what does that mean? You know, it, it means that they're asking users to continue to trust them, to continue to trust that the internet can be secure, that you know you can you can share personal information and not feel kind of invasively targeted, and that your information is being exploited by bad actors. I mean, you know, I think they're going to have to go through the midterm elections in 2018 and probably the next presidential election in 2020, and we're going to be looking very closely to see if Facebook is being weaponized in the same way that it was in 2016. So Mark Zuckerberg is going to be testifying next week, two days before House and Senate committees. What are you expecting to hear from him? I think more of the same, right? A, a, 
ap right. apologizing this is the continuation and of taking the apology responsibility tour. and outline these actions. I don't think we're going to get revelations uh, next week. There are going to be some pointed questions that he probably can't answer, right? The, the uh, Congress is going to want to know where is this personal information uh, and what is being done with it. And, and you know, this is, you know, Facebook has taken some steps to address the root cause of, of, the, of the exploitation that led to the Cambridge Analytica fiasco, but it really can't do anything to put those cows back in the barn, right? The data is already out there. And I think, you know, this is going to be so high profile that we're going to see a lot of legislators using it, uh, you know, for some, you know, political purposes. There, there will be some theatrics, and I don't, I don't think he's going to necessarily have a great answer for that. All right, I do want to get this quick headline out that Brazil's Supreme Court, um, a judge has ruled that the former president Lula has until 5 p.m. to turn himself in. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison for corruption. We're going to continue to follow this story. 5 p.m. on Friday, he has uh, until 5 p.m. on Friday to turn himself in. So that is one we will be watching. Um, continuing, though, this discussion about Facebook, you know, there are some things that are difficult to square. On one hand, Mark Zuckerberg is saying they've seen no meaningful change in uses. On the other, she is saying there has been a pause among a few advertisers in spending. And then there's this third, anecdotally, we all sort of hear people are disenchanted with Facebook. You know, but ultimately, is it going to hurt? Is it going to hurt the platform? Well, you know, you're right that there's a disconnect between what Mark said yesterday on the conference call that they're not seeing much change in business activity. What Cheryl told you today that there were anecdotal events, and then there's the fact that you know we just we these revelations have been getting worse, right? We just got the 87 million figure, you know, this week. I don't think we know yet. I think it's too soon. Next week, though, that that testimony is going to be, you know, broadcast on the same level of a State of the Union speech. People will be watching. So I think everyone now, Facebook's two billion users, are probably in the midst of some uncomfortable calculations about whether the cost of the service and the price of their privacy is worth it. All right, Brad Stone, our senior executive editor. Thank you so much for breaking it all down. Coming up, taking on China. Top White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow says the U.S. wants to pressure China over trade, not spark an all-out trade war. We will have the very latest next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. A story we continue to watch. Apple CEO Tim Cook is set to be deposed June 27th in its current lawsuit with Qualcomm. The company has told a San Diego federal judge they have reached an agreement for Cook to be questioned by the lawyers for the chipmaker, Qualcomm. In the suit, Qualcomm accuses Apple of lying to regulators to spur investigations of Qualcomm and threatening it to cover up the use of inferior parts in some iPhones. Well, President Trump's top economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, told Bloomberg earlier that the president is, quote, properly wary of China, but still expects the U.S. to ultimately reach an agreement on trade with its fellow economic superpower. Take a listen. Both countries have just proposed tariffs. There's been nothing enacted. And I think that's an important point. And here in the U.S., you know, we're going to put it out for comment for a couple months. So I don't want to pinpoint a deadline. That's Bob Lighthizer's area. But I would just say it's, it's nothing around the corner. It's going to be big discussion about it. Obviously, all the senators will weigh in, and we welcome that. Meantime, White House Trade Advisor Peter Navarro says the U.S. will hold high-level trade talks with Beijing before any tariffs on Chinese imports take effect. Navarro told CNBC that discussions will occur during the 60-day period when Americans can provide the government with feedback on the proposed trade measures. One company that could potentially be hit hard with these tariffs, Flexport, a full-service global freight forwarder and logistics platform to enhance user experience in global trade. CEO Ryan Peterson joins us now. And actually, it's your companies and the, the company's products that you guys transport um, that we are talking about here. Who's going to get hit hardest by these tariffs? I think there's a broad category. They, they tried to not hit the things that consumers use every single day. So you may not notice it as much as you, you know, they intentionally made it so that it wouldn't hit people too hard. But it is things like fitness wearables, fire extinguishers, thermostats, dishwashers. There's like a lot of consumer goods in there as well as uh, agricultural equipment. 
beer making equipment, motorcycles, guns. I mean, it's a broad set of categories. What about tech in particular? I think wearables would be one that I'd have my eye on in the in the tech category. And how will this impact Flexport specifically, given that these are your customers? Yeah, so uh, Flexport has about 2,500 companies that we ship for internationally. Of those, we looked in, uh, within, an, uh, within an hour of the tariff codes being announced, we were able to understand that 7% of them are affected. So it's not a huge part of the customer base, and yet if you look at it, for those affected, it's like as much as 100% of their shipments that are going to get hit. So how do they handle that blow? We'll see. I, supply chains take a long time to process. You have to actually make plans about where are you going to produce things, what are you going to produce, what components go in, which determine the customs duty. Uh, it's not something that can just be changed overnight. So we're working really hard over time to help them plan around this. You know, there are some big questions, and we heard Larry Kudlow there saying nothing's going to happen for months, but there is some big question about what the total damage could be and what the total damage will be. Yeah, and I think that's the problem here is that businesses like to operate in an environment of certainty. And if you don't know what is going to happen, how do you plan for that? And it's not just the imports. I mean, every side of a Chinese export is a U.S. importer that's affected, but the Chinese are now retaliating. U.S. exports to China are going to be hit. Soybeans, those plants are already in the ground. I don't know how you're going to not, you know, we sold $12 billion of soybeans to China last year. If we can't ship them, what do we do? Right, so let's rewind a little bit. Had these tariffs been in place last year, what would the impact have been? Uh, well, it's about $50 billion of, of merchandise, or, uh, which you're talking about a 25% duty rate. So this is, you know, these are big numbers. It's kind of hard for us to, you know, like get our head around what they mean. But for the companies affected, it can really be the difference between profitability and bankruptcy. Ultimately, I mean, there's a lot of questions about whether the U.S. is, is really losing in our relationship with China and therefore is this trade war necessary. What's your opinion? I, I think it, it's really important to remember that trade has two sides. And so every, every single Chinese export has an American business that's importing something, and they voluntarily participate in that trade because it makes their business better off. These businesses employ people, and they have customers. And so th suddenly changing that, the rules of the game makes it very hard for businesses to operate. And, and these two, the, you know, customers depend on these products. So it's, it's really chaotic. So what are you telling your customers, and what are your customers telling you? Well, that's our first priority is like figuring out who's affected by how much. Much. We've been able to reach out to all the customers in the last 24 hours, actually talk to them, figure out, you know, let them know this would be the impact on you. Uh, it doesn't go into effect for 90 days, so for a lot of them, it's like real time planning. Maybe we should start importing faster, get like start pulling forward inventory, get it into the country. And then there's a longer term planning that has to take place of should you consider producing in other countries or should you engineer your product to be to, to get classified as a different code. What do you make of the president's uh, war of words with Amazon? Um, you know, he literally just landed from West Virginia and said yet again, Amazon is not a level playing field. It's a company he's going to be taking a closer look at. Of course, we don't know how much of this smoke, how, how much of this will lead to fire. But, um, you know, he's really taking direct aim at, you know, the biggest e-commerce com company in the world and, you know, one of the biggest players in logistics, um, which is your territory. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, what did he call them? He said they were making USPS their delivery boy. Right. Um, I, it's, it's really odd because Amazon's one of the most successful dynamic American companies. It's the, probably, you know, right now it's taking over a lot of industries. It's, it's a great company. It's very innovative. And so it's kind of hard to, to say on the one hand, we, we want to support American industry and support American business, and we're going to put up tariff codes to protect the U.S. Uh, economy, and then on the other hand, pick a fight with maybe our best company. Well, you wonder if maybe he's, he's directing his ire more at the uh, owner of the Washington Post, of which Jeff Bezos is. Um, Ryan Peterson, CEO of Flexport, thank you so much for joining us. We're obviously going to continue to keep an eye on these tariffs. Also, I should disclose that Bloomberg Beta, our venture capital arm, is an investor in Flexport. Coming up, shares of Spotify are stabilizing in the public markets as more analysts give a buy rating on the stock. This is Bloomberg. to a stock we are watching Spotify shares finishing the day slightly down 0.16 percent but the interesting news is that fewer shares were sold than expected in its direct listing debut on Tuesday just about 5 percent or 5.6 million shares changed hands at the opening price according to Bloomberg data this potentially contributed to an initial shortage that drove the price up 
according to people familiar with the matter. Salesforce is tapping the bond market for the first time in five years. A person with knowledge of the matter says the largest manufacturer of online management software is selling unsecured bonds in up to two parts. Salesforce offered $1 billion worth of convertible debt back in 2013, which matured this week. The proceeds of the new debt will be used to finance Salesforce's $6.5 billion purchase of MuleSoft, its largest deal ever. Amazon is adding several jobs in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. This signals Jeff Bezos' desire to expand in the country following a closely watched meeting with the Crown Prince. Saudi Arabia Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman met with Amazon's CEO in Seattle last week. The 32-year-old heir apparent to the throne had planned to discuss a potential project with the Ministry of Energy for Amazon to build a data center in the country. This would be the first in the Middle East for the world's largest cloud provider. Saudi Arabia's 30-year ban on movie theaters is coming to an end, and AMC is looking for a grand opening night in the kingdom. The world's largest movie chain was granted the first cinema license in Saudi Arabia and plans to open 100 locations there, 40 within five years and 60 more by 2030. AMC CEO says theaters won't be initially segregated by gender, but some showtimes may be. The first movie to be screened in Saudi Arabia, Marvel's Black Panther. Coming up, the EU is rolling out new data privacy laws just as Facebook tries to repair its trust with government officials. We'll talk about the next steps. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Technology, I'm Emily Chang. The European Union is closely watching Facebook's actions in the wake of its massive data scandal. A spokesman for the bloc said the EU will contact data protection officials to follow up investigations into whether Facebook breached EU privacy laws. Meantime, speaking to the press yesterday, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg said the EU's new privacy rules set to go into effect next month are very positive and he's going to make the same controls available for users everywhere. Take a listen. We intend to make all the same controls and settings available everywhere, not just in Europe. Um, is it going to be exactly the same format? Probably not. Um, we'll, we need to figure out what makes sense in, in, in different markets with the different laws and in different places. But, um, but let me repeat this. You know, we're going to make all the same controls and settings available everywhere, not just in Europe. For more, I want to blink, bring in Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde in London. So, Caroline, that was new that these uh, EU privacy controls are going to go into effect worldwide. What do you make of it? Interesting that, in fact, we're not going to have just one rule rolled out in Europe and then a slightly different set of privacy measures in the rest of the world. They are, in fact, going to respond to the so-called general data protection rules, those really tough regulations coming into place in Europe on May the 25th. They're going to respond worldwide to this. And remember, this is giving more access to your data for the 500 million Europeans, more access, also knowing and able ability to control that data and in some times be able to delete that data. Therefore, we're seeing plenty of measures being rolled out. And in some parts, ironically, maybe this is what we're seeing at the moment. The fact that we're seeing this fast paced reaction from Facebook, some of those slightly more cynical in Europe are going, well, maybe these measures were planned anyway in a response, not to the data leak that we saw at Cambridge Analytica, but in a response to GDPR that comes in later in May. Because we've seen Facebook ever since January, Sheryl Sandberg was talking about new data measures. She had a new privacy center globally being un unveiled. And now we see more control of your apps. Well, maybe all of this was planned anyhow. That's what the cynics are saying out there. What have your European regulators said in the last 24 hours since we learned that actually the number of people potentially affected in the Cambridge Analytics scandal could be much higher, 87 million, and that, you know, 2 billion people, Facebook is saying, that potentially all of its users could have had their public profiles scraped? 
I think that really sent a few shockwaves through Europe and we've heard yet more vehement talk coming from the leaders. In particular, you've heard Vera Jarova, she's the head of the EU, in particular Justice Commissioner. She's been saying, look, I've got, I'm in touch with them, we're going to have high-level contacts over the next few days. We've heard from Germany. Now, remember, Germany has some of the toughest regulations out there on social media. They really worry about their privacy and their data. They had the Justice Commissioner come out fighting once again. She was saying that you need clear rules and that ethical values are being breached in, well, in sacrifice because of the bottom line. Meanwhile, what I think more importantly is closer to home in the UK here. The ICO is the regulator, the watchdog that's actually doing the investigation on behalf of the whole of the EU. Now, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, has said they are in, they're in close contact with Facebook. They say that they are cooperating with the regulators over at Facebook and they welcome the changes that have been made by Facebook so far. But I will add, they say it's too early to say whether they're sufficient under new law. And talking about the business, we got the first sort of indication of, of just how this scandal is impacting the bottom line. Um, Sandberg telling us that a few advertisers have paused their spending, but at the same time, Zuckerberg saying that they've seen no meaningful change in usage despite all of the sort of perceived anger um, and resentment among users right now about these latest revelations. I mean, you know, what do we know about how uh, this could actually impact the bottom line? I think this is what's so ironic about the whole situation is that if all these unveilings had happened prior to 2015, there, well, if, if, if we had seen these now, and the, the fact, if GDPR, the so-called General Data Protection Rule, had been in place when all of this came to a head, well, we could have seen some hefty fines. Remember, GDPR allows you to fine up to 4% of global revenue if they don't abide by these new tougher regulation rules, these privacy rules that would have been broken if the Cambridge Analytics scandal likely would have occurred under them. So we could have seen a 1 billion euros worth of fines heading towards Facebook if that indeed had been the case. So fines could have been an issue, but now going forward we're going to see whether this really does hit the bottom line as you say data currently as it stands you need explicit consent going forward to use certain data of perhaps your race your ethnicity your political um, opinions well if you can't target your user base as you used to be able to how are they going to keep attracting the advertisers this must be baked into many an analyst's expectations. We know price targets out there still remain relatively high for Facebook. We know that only two sell recommendations are out there on the Facebook stock. But analysts are going to have to look at this regulatory overhang. And this is why you've got the likes of Nordea Bank saying, for the time being, we're not allowing any more purchase of Facebook shares. All right, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde for us live in London. Thanks so much, Caroline. Meantime, Twitter disclosed it suspended 274,000 accounts in the last half of 2017 linked to extremism. The company says it's removed 1.2 million terror-related accounts since 2015. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Tech's Selena Wang, who covers Twitter. So, you know, obviously this has been an ongoing process. You know, what do we make of, you know, another evolution here? So this is actually the second consecutive quarter that the amount of accounts being suspended has actually declined. Now, uh, Twitter is attributing that to Twitter becoming a less desirable place for terrorism content. Now, that being said, the sheer numbers are still incredibly large and shows that it's an ongoing challenge for them. More than 1.2 million accounts being suspended over the past two years. We have seen the companies really try to get ahead of potential regulation. We've seen lawmakers say that if terrorist content is not taken off immediately, there could be fines that are levied against these companies. So they've created this sort of global internet counterterrorism forum to try and share these unique unique hashes, unique data of the most violent imagery to try and be able to capture that content across the board. But there's still a lot of questions that remain, which is how often is this terrorism for a meeting? Do they have office space? Where are they storing this data? What is the progress of it overall? So there's still a lot of questions that regulators have and everyday uh, terrorism experts are seeing content continually to being uploaded that are related to terrorists. Now, you know, in the midst of all of this, you know, Facebook news, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, has also been invited to testify, but we don't know if he will be in, in Washington next week, correct? You know, talk to us about sort of the Facebook hangover that Twitter is feeling. Twitter has declined to comment several times despite my continual asks <laughs> about how Jack Dorsey is thinking about this problem. 
What I'm thinking is that they're definitely going to be watching Zuckerberg very closely. They're going to be seeing how he performs, how lawmakers respond. Now, Twitter is sitting in a better position than Facebook because they simply don't capture as much data on their users. Twitter as a platform is public, so most of what is shared to advertisers is already publicly available anyways. However, we are seeing investors react negatively to Twitter just because it is also a social media platform and it will be vulnerable to any potential regulations that could hit Facebook. All right, Selena Wang, our Bloomberg Tech reporter. Thank you so much for that update. Coming up, the future of online security has come into question over the last few weeks. What web performance and security company Cloudflare is doing to protect your data? That is next. This is Bloomberg. Over the last few weeks, we've seen countless experts and analysts speak out about the importance of data privacy. Cloudflare is no different. However, the company is implementing something that could help create a faster, safer, and more private internet for everyone. On Sunday, the company announced it is launching a DNS service for consumers called 1.1.1.1, providing users a way to shorten load times of web pages and keep some data away from network providers. Here with us, Cloudflare co-founder and chief operating officer, Michelle Zatlin. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I want to start with you know this idea that Facebook and Google really aren't the worst of these companies. In fact, there are many other companies that know a lot more about us. Explain. Yeah, well, I mean, exactly right. I think right now in the news, there's a lot of conversation around privacy, as there should be. But this has been a conversation we've been having for a long time, and it kind of keeps coming and going. Because with technology, more and more people are getting online. And more and more, whether it's internet properties, your internet service provider, cookie, ad tracking cookie companies, there's lots of different companies who know a lot about you and what you're doing online. And as you think about that, you think, that's a little creepy. Right, what do they know? They know, they well, it depends on who it is, but it can know which websites you're going to, what you're clicking, which, which one you're clicking more of versus other sites, um, different ads that appear, which ones do you click through, which ones you don't, and that's why when you're, you know, maybe shopping for a new couch somewhere, then the couch, or a new pair of shoes, and it follows you around online, and it's like, buy me, buy me, buy me. Do they use that data? That a lot of companies do, and you know, there's kind of two sides of the argument. The one side is, well, if uh, a cons customer is coming and interested in learning more, and I know they want this new pair of shoes, of course, it should, I want to be very targeted in showing it to them over and over again. So eventually, you're like, okay, fine, put it in my checkout basket. I'm just finally gonna, I need, I need it. Buy it now. Um, and so there's that one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is like, where do you draw the line? And as a consumer, I think what we're seeing with a lot of these large tech companies or just tech companies in general is. I want to know who has my data and what you're doing with it. And, and that I don't necessarily want people or businesses to know exactly what I'm doing online. And I think that that's why this conversation keeps coming up over and over again around privacy of what can I do to be more private in my life? And what am I OK with a business having? And which businesses am I OK with it having? So Cloudflare's new product, yes. how does that restrict the amount of data that these companies can have about me? Well, one of the types of companies that knows a lot about you is whoever you're buying internet access from. So if you're at home, you have internet access, which most uh, households in America do. They know every single website you're visiting, every day, every night, every weekend. And you think about that and you think, ah. Now, they might not know what you're doing on that site, but they know exactly what sites you're visiting. Oh, and by the way, they know your name and where you live because they're your internet service provider. Uh, last year, about a year ago, the Senate removed, um, passed a new law where they said, if you are the internet service provider, so if you're buying internet from AT&T or for Comcast, that those providers can now sell the data that they have about you to advertisers. And you think, do you want that? Um, and so again, this idea of privacy has been coming up long, long. Six months ago, our technical team, you know, Cloudflare provides performance, security, and reliability to internet properties, but a bunch of engineers that we work with came up and said, we have to do something. It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another to actually come up with a solution to it. So, so what are you doing? Well, exactly. So what 1.1.1.1 is, it's a lot of ones. <laughs> uh, it's four ones. We launched it on April 1st. I was like, did I get that right? Yeah, you okay. did. It. Just keep going. Just more <laughs> ones. You're good. Uh, and basically it is, is if you, for your internet access at home or at your business, you sign up for 1.1.1. It literally takes less than a minute to sign up. And it's, it's a privacy first DNS service. And most people don't know what DNS is. You don't need to know what it is. But it does. you do need DNS to get online. And you keep 
Comcast or AT&T as your internet service provider, but the DNS piece becomes 1.1.1, and now it's privacy first. No, we will not track what you're doing online. Uh, we so were, they will not be able to see where I'm going if I use your product. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, you know, what what's your take on the responsibility or the lack thereof that companies like Facebook and Google have taken on this? Like, should they be doing more not to have that information? I or not to collect that information or to anonymize that information. I'm a definitely a glass half full sort of person. <laughs> so if I look for a silver lining and what's going on right now is I think it's creating conversations of like what are the responsibilities. And you know, when I think about as a leader, I run a, t a large tech company mm -hmm. and I think there are like four constituents that we have a responsibility to. First is your shareholders, mm -hmm. right? You need to do well by your shareholders. You need to do well by your customers. You need to do well by your um, employees, which is really important. And then you need to do well by your communities. And I think that the new model of leadership for tomorrow is thinking about all four of those constituents. And I think a lot of the issues that come up are when you get one of them wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I definitely think the new age of leadership is to think about all four constituents and the companies who do that are the ones who are going to grow and, and, and capitalize on the opportunity going forward. And I think that's a good thing. All right. Michelle Zatlin, Cloudflare COO and co-founder, thank you so much thank you. for stopping by. One dot one dot one dot one. <laughs> okay. Coming up, fixing Facebook. Can the world's biggest social media platform protect its users? Does the government need to get involved? That is next. This is Bloomberg. Earlier today, Facebook CEO Sheryl Sandberg called protecting people's data an arms race and said Facebook is committed to security for the very long run. But is that enough to create a truly socially responsible network? My next guest thinks it's time to regulate the Internet. That is the title of his most recent article in The Atlantic. Before that, he was taking on what he calls the existential threat of big tech in his book, World Without Mind. He also served two stints as editor of The New Republic, including one under Facebook co-founder Chris Hughes. Franklin Four, welcome to Bloomberg Technology. So let's get to that first question I asked. Yeah. I know you saw uh, the interview with Sheryl Sandberg earlier in the show. Is what Facebook is saying, what Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg are saying, is it enough? No, it's not enough because they have a track record now. They've demonstrably been careless with people's data. They've been voracious in collecting information and surveilling, and their business just too deeply depends on that collection of data. Without that collection of data, they, they're, they're severely weakened. And so we can't trust companies at this point to be good stewards of data and privacy. We need to have rules, just as if we have rules in our financial system or agriculture or every other part of the American economy. What should the rules be? So I think we need to formulate something that's close to our own version of what the Europeans are doing with their new um, privacy regime, which is going to come online next month. Um, I think we need to create... Uh, we need to give people opportunities to control their own data and control the ways in which they're, they're surveilled across the Internet. I think we need to make it harder for companies to impose terms of service agreements on users where users um, have zero terms, uh, zero ability to, to negotiate the terms. And so um, I don't think it's that hard to come up with a set of rules. I think that there are lots of examples out of there. I think we need to have a regulator that's committed to those rules. Right now, the FTC is so lax and so um, not on the ball when it comes to dealing with these questions. I think we need to have a national data protection authority like other countries do. You know, talk to us about the impact that you think all of this has had on journalism and yeah. data science. You know, obviously, I know you worked at the New Republic. Actually, right. um, you were pushed out under under Chris Hughes, who's a co-founder of Facebook, um, who, it, it, interestingly, you know, has has also um, you know talked a bit more um, freely about. Facebook's responsibility yes. in the world and, and the, the lack potentially of them rising to such a, a responsibility. But how is this affecting news and how we get it? So it's the problem, there are two problems that exist in parallel. The first problem 
is the problem of privacy and data. But the second problem is that journalism has just become hugely dependent on Facebook. And because of that dependence, because journalism needs the traffic that comes through Facebook, the values of Facebook end up becoming the values of journalism. And journalism has ended up pandering in a lot of its decisions or ad adapting in a lot of its decisions in order to be maximally successful on Facebook. Unfortunately, uh, Facebook has been terrible for journalism's underlying business because Facebook has, has, has gobbled up such a huge percentage of the digital advertising market. There's just not a lot of dollars left there for journalism because journalism doesn't have data. Journalism can't compete with Facebook when it comes to the targeting of ads. And so I think we're actually at a place where there's going to be a parting of the ways between journalism and Facebook. You, you, you saw this long before Facebook's most recent Cambridge Analytica crisis, where Facebook was starting to adapt to return to its core model of being a, a, a true social network that's about friends, keeping in touch with friends, sharing pictures with friends, and that journalism was going to be devalued in its algorithms. And I think that ultimately that decision and that separation is going to be healthy both for journalism and also healthy for Facebook itself. Because Facebook doesn't want to be in the role of being the global arbiter of truth. What would you like to see from Mark Zuckerberg next week when he testifies before Congress? You know, it, he, 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 he has to, he can't, he, he's got a serious trust deficit. I mean, there's nothing that Mark Zuckerberg can tell to me that will make me ultimately trust him again or trust him when it comes to the handling of data. I, mean, I think that he's, he's really dug himself into a hole. And I think that the company's reaction to the election and the way in which it hasn't really fully owned up to the lapses and its problems until uh, journalism has essentially forced Facebook to own up to those problems means that, I mean, the, the, how do you get out of a trust deficit like that? I don't know if it's, if it's really possible to do in one appearance before Congress. He's going to have to just sit there and take his licking. All right. Franklin Four, author of okay. World Without Mind, The Existential Threat of Big Tech. Thanks for joining. We are going to be in Washington next week covering Mark Zuckerberg's testimony. Um, and that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.